John Emmerich Edward Dalberg Acton, 1st Baron Acton, the 10th of January 1834 to the 19th of June 1902, was an English Catholic historian, politician, and writer. He was the only son of Sir Ferdinand Dalberg Acton, 7th Baronet, and a grandson of the Neapolitan Admiral and Prime Minister Sir John Acton, 6th Baronet. Between 1837 and 1869, he was known as Sir John Dalberg Acton, 8th Baronet. He is perhaps best known for the remark, "'Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Great men are almost always bad men,' which he made in a letter to an Anglican bishop. <laughs> Early life John Acton's grandfather succeeded to the baronetcy and family estates in Shropshire in 1791. The estates had previously been held by another English branch of the Acton family. John Acton's grandfather was a member of a younger line of the family which had transferred itself to France and, subsequently, to Italy, but, subsequent to the extinction of the elder branch, he became the patriarch of the family. His grandfather's eldest son, Richard, who was his father, married Marie-Louise Pauline, the only daughter and heiress of Emmerich Joseph, 1st Duc de Dalberg, who was a naturalized French noble of ancient German lineage who had entered the French service under Napoleon and represented Louis XVIII at the Congress of Vienna in 1814. Subsequent to Sir Richard Acton's death in 1837, she became the wife of the second Earl Granville 1840. Marie-Louise Pauline de Dalberg was heiress of Hernsheim in Germany. She became the mother of John Dalberg Acton who was born in Naples, he was raised as a Roman Catholic, and was educated at Oscott College, under the future Cardinal Nicholas Wiseman, until 1848. He then studied privately at Edinburgh. He was denied entry to the University of Cambridge because he was a Catholic, and subsequently went to Munich where he studied at the university and resided in the house of Johann Joseph Ignaz von Dollinger, the theologian and forerunner of the Old Catholic Church, with whom he became lifelong friends. Dollinger inspired in him a deep love of historical research and a profound conception of its functions as a critical instrument in the study of socio-political liberty. He was a master of the principal foreign languages, and began at an early age to collect a magnificent historical library, which he intended to use to compose a history of liberty. In politics, he was always an ardent liberal. Topic. Career Through extensive travels, Acton spent much time in the chief intellectual centers reading the actual correspondence of historical personalities. Among his friends were Montalembert, Tocqueville, Fustel de Coulange, Bluntschley, von Seibel and Rank. In 1855, he was appointed deputy lieutenant of Shropshire. A year later, he was attached to Lord Granville's mission to Moscow as British representative at the coronation of Alexander II of Russia. Topic. Politics In 1859, Acton settled in England, at his country house, Aldenham, in Shropshire. He was returned to the House of Commons that same year as member for the Irish Borough of Carlow and became a devoted admirer and adherent of Prime Minister William Ewart Gladstone. However, Acton was not an active MP, and his parliamentary career came to an end after the general election of 1865, when he headed the Liberal ballot for Bridgenorth near his Shropshire home. Acton defeated Conservative leader Henry Whitmore, who successfully petitioned for a scrutiny of the ballots, and thus retained his own seat and Acton lost his new seat. After the Reform Act 1867, Acton again contested Bridgenorth, this time reduced to a single seat, in 1868 but to no avail. Acton took a great interest in the United States, considering its federal structure the perfect guarantor of individual liberties. During the American Civil War, his sympathies lay entirely with the Confederacy, for their defense of states' rights against a centralized government that he believed would, by what he thought to be all historical precedent, inevitably turn tyrannical. His notes to Gladstone on the subject helped sway many in the British government to sympathize with the South. After the South's surrender, he wrote to Robert E. Lee that, I mourn for the stake which was lost at Richmond more deeply than I rejoice over that which was saved at Waterloo. Adding that he deemed that you were fighting battles for our liberty, our progress, and our civilization. Acton's stance on the Confederacy was shared by most English Catholics at the time, both liberal and ultramontane. 
The editors of the Ultramontane Tablet denounced Abraham Lincoln as a dangerous radical, and John Henry Newman, when asked for his opinion on the matter, stated that slavery was not intrinsically evil and that the issue had to be assessed on a case by case basis. In 1869, Queen Victoria raised Acton to the peerage as Baron Acton, of Aldenham in the county of Shropshire. His elevation came primarily through the intercession of Gladstone. The two were intimate friends and frequent correspondents. Matthew Arnold said that, Gladstone influences all round him but Acton, it is Acton who influences Gladstone. Acton was appointed to the Royal Victorian Order as a Knight Commander in the 1897 Birthday Honours. He was also a strong supporter of Irish Home Rule. <laughs> Religion and writings Meanwhile, Acton became the editor of the Roman Catholic monthly paper, The Rambler, in 1859, upon John Henry later Cardinal Newman's retirement from the editorship. In 1862, he merged this periodical into the Home and Foreign Review. His contributions at once gave evidence of his remarkable wealth of historical knowledge. Though a sincere Roman Catholic, his whole spirit as a historian was hostile to ultramontane pretensions, and his independence of thought and liberalism of view speedily brought him into conflict with the Roman Catholic hierarchy. As early as August 1862, Cardinal Wiseman publicly censured the review, and when in 1864, after Dollinger's appeal at the Munich Congress for a less hostile attitude towards historical criticism, the Pope issued a declaration that the opinions of Catholic writers were subject to the authority of the Roman congregations, Acton felt that there was only one way of reconciling his literary conscience with his ecclesiastical loyalty, and he stopped the publication of his monthly periodical. He continued, however, to contribute articles to the North British Review, which, previously a Scottish Free Church organ, had been acquired by friends in sympathy with him, and which for some years until 1872, when it ceased publication promoted the interests of a high-class liberalism in both temporal and ecclesiastical matters. Acton also did a good deal of lecturing on historical subjects. In the March 1862 Rambler, Acton wrote, The Celts are not among the progressive, initiative races, but among those which supply the materials rather than the impulse of history, and are either stationary or retrogressive. The Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, and the Teutons are the only makers of history, the only authors of advancement. Other races possessing a highly developed language, a speculative religion, enjoying luxury and art, attain to a certain pitch of cultivation which they are unable to either communicate or to increase. They are a negative element in the world. And subjection to a people of a higher capacity for government is of itself no misfortune, and it is to most countries the condition of their political advancement. In 1870, along with his mentor Dollinger, Acton opposed the moves to promulgate the doctrine of papal infallibility in the First Vatican Council, traveling to Rome to lobby against it, ultimately unsuccessfully. Unlike Dollinger Acton did not become an old Catholic, and continued attending Mass regularly, he received the last rites on his deathbed. The Catholic Church did not try to force his hand. It was in this context that, in a letter he wrote to scholar and ecclesiastic Mandel Creighton, dated April 1887, Acton made his most famous pronouncement. But if we might discuss this point until we found that we nearly agreed, and if we do agree thoroughly about the impropriety of Carlyle's denunciations and Pharisaism in history, I cannot accept your canon that we are to judge Pope and King unlike other men, with a favorable presumption that they did no wrong. If there is any presumption it is the other way, against the holders of power, increasing as the power increases. Historic responsibility has to make up for the want of legal responsibility. Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Great men are almost always bad men, even when they exercise influence and not authority, still more when you superadd the tendency or the certainty of corruption by authority. There is no worse heresy than that the office sanctifies the holder of it. That is the point at which the negation of Catholicism and the negation of liberalism meet and keep high festival, and the end learns to justify the means. You would hang a man of no position like Revilic, but if what one hears is true, then Elizabeth asked the jailer to murder Mary, and William III of England ordered his Scots minister to extirpate a clan. Here are the greatest names coupled with the greatest crimes, you would spare those criminals, for some mysterious reason. I would hang them higher than Haman, for reasons of quite obvious justice, still more, still higher for the sake of historical science. Thenceforth he steered clear of theological polemics. He devoted himself to reading, study and congenial society. 
With all his capacity for study, he was a man of the world and a man of affairs, not a bookworm. His only notable publications were a masterly essay in the Quarterly Review of January 1878 on Democracy in Europe, two lectures delivered at Bridge North in 1877 on The History of Freedom in Antiquity, and The History of Freedom in Christianity. These last the only tangible portions put together by him of his long projected History of Liberty, and an essay on modern German historians in the first number of the English Historical Review, which he helped to found 1886. After 1879 he divided his time between London, Cannes, and Tegensee in Bavaria, enjoying and reciprocating the society of his friends. In 1872 he had been given the honorary degree of Doctor of Philosophy by the University of Munich, in 1888 Cambridge gave him the honorary degree of Doctor of Laws, and in 1889 Oxford the Doctor of Civil Law, and in 1890 he received the high academic accolade of being made a Fellow of All Souls College, Oxford. In 1874, when Gladstone published his pamphlet on the Vatican decrees in their bearing on civil allegiance, Lord Acton wrote during November and December a series of remarkable letters to the Times, illustrating Gladstone's main theme by numerous historical examples of papal inconsistency, in a way which must have been bitter enough to the Ultramontane party, but ultimately disagreeing with Gladstone's conclusion and insisting that the Church itself was better than its premises implied. Acton's letters led to another storm in the English Roman Catholic world, but once more it was considered prudent by the Holy See to leave him alone. In spite of his reservations, he regarded communion with Rome as dearer than life. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Personal life. In 1865 Acton married Countess Marie Anna Ludmilla Euphrosina von Arco auf Valley, daughter of the Bavarian Count Maximilian von Arco auf Valley, by whom he had six children Hun. Mary Elizabeth Ann Dalberg Acton 1866 married L. T. Call. Edward Blydian Herbert and had issue. Hun. Annie Mary Catherine Dalberg Acton 1868 Richard Leon Dalberg Acton, 2nd Baron Acton 1870-1924. Hun. John Dalberg Dalberg Acton 1872-1873. Hun. Elizabeth Mary Dalberg Acton 1874-1881. Hun. Jean Marie Dalberg Acton 1876-1919. His nephew was Anton Graf von Arco auf Valley 1897-1945, a German count and political activist, an assassin of socialist Bavarian minister president Kurt Eisner in 1919. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Professor at Cambridge. Acton's reputation for learning gradually spread abroad, largely through Gladstone's influence. Gladstone found him a valuable political advisor, and in 1892, when the Liberal government came in, Lord Acton was made a lord-in-waiting. Finally, in 1895, on the death of Sir John Seeley, Lord Rosebery appointed him to the Regius Professorship of Modern History at Cambridge. He delivered two courses of lectures on the French Revolution and on modern history, but it was in private that the effects of his teaching were felt most. The Cambridge Modern History, though he did not live to see it, was planned under his editorship. <laughs> <laughs> Death and legacy Lord Acton became ill in 1901 and died on 19 June 1902 in Tegensee. He was succeeded in the title by his son, Richard Leon Dalberg Acton, 2nd Baron Acton. His 60,000-volume library, formed for use and not for display and composed largely of books full of his own annotations, was bought prior to his death by Andrew Carnegie in secret in order to secure the library for Acton's use during his lifetime, then upon Lord Acton's death, presented to John Morley, who forthwith gave it to the University of Cambridge. According to Hugh Chisholm, editor of the 1911 Encyclopaedia Britannica, Lord Acton has left too little completed original work to rank among the great historians, his very learning seems to have stood in his way, he knew too much and his literary conscience was too acute for him to write easily, and his copiousness of information overloads his literary style. But he was one of the most deeply learned men of his time, and he will certainly be remembered for his influence on others. Topic. Styles of address 
1834 to 1837, Mr. John Dalberg Acton. 1837 to 1855, Sir John Dalberg Acton. 1855 to 1859, Sir John Dalberg Acton. 1859 to 1866, Sir John Dalberg Acton. 1866 to 1869, Sir John Dalberg Acton. 1869 to 1897, the Right Honorable the Lord Acton. 1897 to 1902, the Right Honorable the Lord Acton. Topic, ancestry. Topic, notable quotations. History is the arbiter of controversy, the monarch of all she surveys. Universal history is not a burden on the memory but an illumination of the soul. There is not a more perilous or immoral habit of mind than the sanctifying of success. Said of Oliver Cromwell, the strong man with the dagger is followed by the weak man with the sponge. The science of politics is the one science that is deposited by the streams of history, like the grains of gold in the sand of a river, and the knowledge of the past, the record of truths revealed by experience, is eminently practical, as an instrument of action and a power that goes to making the future. Save for the wild force of nature, nothing moves in this world that is not Greek in its origin. Liberty is not the power of doing what we like, but the right of being able to do what we ought. The wisdom of divine rule appears not in the perfection but in the improvement of the world. History is the true demonstration of religion. Topic works topic See also Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty topic Notes topic References This article incorporates text from a publication now in the public domain, Chisholm, Hugh, ed. 1911. Acton, John Emmerich Edward Dalberg Acton, 1st Baron. Encyclopædia Britannica, 1 11th ed. Cambridge University Press pp. 159-160. Topic further reading Acton, Harold, 1961. Lord Acton. Chicago Review, 15 1, 31-44. doi, 10.2307, Boyd, Kelly, ed. Encyclopedia of Historians and Historical Writers Rutledge, 1999, 1-1-2 Brinton, Crane, 1919. Lord Acton's Philosophy of History. The Harvard Theological Review. 12 1, 84-112. doi, 10.1017 per seconds 0017816000100300. JSTOR 1507914. Chadwick, Owen Acton and Gladstone. London, Athlone Press. Chadwick, Owen Acton and History. Cambridge University Press. Dean, Seamus F. 1972. Lord Acton and Edmund Burke. Journal of the History of Ideas. 33 to 325-335. doi, 10.2307, Drew, Mary Gladstone. 1924. Acton and Gladstone, in, Acton, Gladstone, and others. London, Nisbet & Co., Ltd., pp. 1-31. Engel you know see, Friedrich 1941. Reflections of Lord Acton on Historical Principles. The Catholic Historical Review. 27 166-185. George Eugene 1952. Acton's Political Philosophy, and Analysis. London, Hollis. Gasquet, Abbott 1906. Lord Acton and His Circle. London, Byrne and Oates. Himmelfarb, Gertrude, 1952. Lord Action, A Study in Conscience and Politics. Chicago, Illinois, University of Chicago Press. Hill, Roland, 2000. Lord Acton. New Haven, Connecticut and London, Yale University Press. Kirk, Russell, 1994. Lord Acton on Revolution. Grand Rapids, Michigan, Acton Institute. Lang, Timothy, 2002. Lord Acton and The Insanity of Nationality. Journal of the History of Ideas. 63 129-149. doi, 10.2307, Lossky, Harold J. Lord Acton, Idealist. The Dial, Vol. 
LXV, pp. 59-61. Lilly, W.S. 1911. Lord Acton and the French Revolution. The Dublin Review, Vol. CXLVIII, pp. 213-229. Littleton, Maud. 1904. Mr. Gladstone's Friendship with Lord Acton, Lippincott's Magazine, Vol. LXXIV, pp. 610-616. Matthew, David 1946. Acton, The Formative Years. London, Eyre and Spottiswood. Matthew, David 1968. Lord Acton and His Times. London, Eyre and Spottiswood. Massey, Hector J. 1969. Lord Acton's Theory of Nationality. The Review of Politics. 31 4, 495-508. Doi 10.1017 per seconds 00346705000011827. Murphy, Terence. 1984. Lord Acton and the Question of Moral Judgments in History: The Development of His Position. The Catholic Historical Review. 72, 225-250. Nurser, John. 1987. The Reign of Conscience, Individual, Church, and State in Lord Acton's History of Liberty. London, Taylor and Francis. Pezzamenti, Rocco 2001. The Political Thought of Lord Acton, The English Catholics in the Nineteenth Century. Leominster, Gracewing. Poole, Reginald L. 1902. John Emmerich, Lord Acton. The English Historical Review. 17 692 692-699. Doi 10.1093 EHR XVII LXVIII.692. Schuttinger, Robert Lindsay, 1976. Lord Acton, Historian of Liberty. Open Court Publishing Company. Thurston, Herbert, 1906. The Late Lord Acton. The Catholic World, Vol. LXXXIV, pp. 357 to 372. Tulloch, Hugh, 1988. Acton. New York, St. Martin's Press. Watt, E.D. 1966. Rome and Lord Acton, A Reinterpretation. The Review of Politics, 28 493-507. doi, 10.1017 per seconds 00346705000132x. Weaver, Richard M. 1961. Lord Acton, The Historian as Thinker. Modern Age. V. 1, 13 to 22. Topic: External links. Making history biography podcast on power and corruption. See footnote in article for link to podcast works by John Dalberg Acton, First Baron Acton at Project Gutenberg works by John Dalberg Acton, First Baron Acton at LibriVox public domain audiobooks works by or about John Dalberg Acton, First Baron Acton at Internet Archive works by Lord Acton at Liberty Fund works by Lord Acton at Hathi Trust Acton Institute research on Lord Acton sources from the Acton Institute archival material material relating to John Dalberg Acton, 1st Baron Acton. UK National Archives. Tocqueville Acton Centre for Studies and Documentation Italian and English Lord Acton, Nationality 1862.